At the dawn of the atomic age, the crews of USS Nautilus volunteered for dangers never before faced. Nautilus was the first nuclear sub. They drove her to untried depths, stayed down for weeks at a time, went where no one has ever been. They were exposed to radiation that they were told could affect their children's children. And still, they did their duty, even when sent on a mission so dangerous, so new, that death could come at any second. How did they do it? How did their vessel survive? It takes a certain kind of man and a certain kind of ship to go first. months of intensive work on the construction of the world's first atomic-powered vessel, USS Nautilus, has come to a brief halt on this morning of January 21st, 1954. This huge, awe-inspiring... For all the celebration at the waste. launching of USS Nautilus, no one really knows whether it's going to work. Five years of effort and political infighting have either produced a wonder weapon or an economic and scientific disaster. She will be powered by a nuclear reactor with all the explosive uncertainties of a science in its infancy. The power plant of the Nautilus is the most powerful submarine engine ever built. It could supply the electrical needs of a small city. Driven by this power plant... Many of the dignitaries don't see a nuclear sub as a priority. They would have waited 12 years before she was built. Standing opposite them, are the visionaries who fought uphill to build a ship that can rewrite all the books of naval warfare, if it works. As a sailor, I recognize this ship as the beginning of a new chapter in the history of sea power. Nautilus promises to fulfill the dream of Jules Verne's 20,000 leagues under the sea. That Nautilus was propelled by a power past imagining. This new power can change the face of the world, can raise up a new and better civilization. There you go, hit it. In her voyage now begun, the Nautilus bears the hopes of mankind. When World War II ends with an atomic blast, the days of the diesel sub are numbered. The Navy sees the wartime nuclear empire passing to the Air Force's bomber. The fleet must find its share of the atomic future. We'll say, you know, there's this new nuclear stuff. This is going to be pretty hot. And there's a view that, yes, that'll happen, but it's a long-term proposition. What turns it into a short-term proposition is a wiry, iron-fisted martinet who has never seen war action or commanded a vessel larger than a minesweeper. An observer writes of Captain Hyman Rickover, he believed the shortest distance between two points was a straight line, even if it bisected six admirals. He was a driver, he was going to solve the problems, and he was going to move anyone who was in the way out of the way if he possibly could. Captain Rickover comes into this meeting where everyone is complaining that no one wants to finance this stuff. And he says, not my problem. Everyone thinks nuclear power is the future. It's going to be the big civilian power source. So all of these companies are willing to finance everything themselves. They'll build the labs for us. The other thing about Rickover is that he's figured out that his technology is a lot more mature than anyone imagined. He can start designing a real naval reactor and he can build it. That program was approved in 1954. The natural platform is a sub. Part of the reason is, it's a very powerful plant for a sub. It would have been peanuts for a larger ship. A Nautilus produces about 15,000 horsepower. For a destroyer, you'd need 60 or 80. For a carrier, you'd need something like 200. 
A nuclear reactor will allow a surface ship to sail longer, but the benefits of this technology will be far greater for diesel subs, which aren't true submarines because they need to surface for air. They're really just submersibles. You've got to understand what a submarine was before Nautilus first. She has a battery. When she's underwater, she lives on the battery. So that means that no matter how fast she wants to go, there's some point, usually after about an hour, that the battery gives out. So one of the big anti-submarine tactics before Nautilus is exhaustion. If you can keep the sub down for, say, an hour or so, if she's at low speed for a lot longer, eventually the battery runs out, she's forced to the surface, she's helpless. With a nuclear sub, forget it. The boat taking shape at Electric Boat Company in Groton, Connecticut, will be powered by a reactor breathing no air. She will carry a years-long fuel supply the size of a football and weighing only 10 pounds. She will be able to run submerged for as long as her food holds out, and her submerged speeds at full power will equal or be faster than surface speeds. Rickover was very well aware of how much you had to test before you could build, but also aware, because of the Cold War, of how urgent the whole project was. His idea was he would build a working reactor, not in a real submarine, at a test site in Idaho. And the real reactor in the real submarine would be a little bit later. And that way he would uncover any design errors. So that allowed him to build faster, and then to, to work out any kinks before the other one was completed. All right, sir, we'll take the reactor up to power. Safety rods out at 10.21. Rickover wants the best of the best for his crew. His selection process is brutal. 1950, when I went to submarine school, uh, we had an assembly, and Admiral, then Captain Rickover came down to talk to the class. And he talked to them about the, this idea he had of having a nuclear submarine. And I leaned over to my seatmate and said, you don't ever want to go to the first one because it'll have all kinds of problems. You wait and put in for the second one. But it was a new venture, and no one really knew what might occur. Even so, volunteers pour in for Nautilus, certain that in a few years, everything from automobiles to toasters will be atomic powered, and that their training will give them an enormous advantage in the post-Navy civilian world. And we thought that there would be uh something that we'd like to get into. We've been on the World War II boats and uh, they uh, pictured the Nautilus as being, a, uh, you know, something like Jules Verne and uh, that intrigued us. Uh, that's why I volunteered, yeah. But Verne's Nautilus had not been powered by a force that had already leveled cities. And maybe, there is another side to building the new reactor into Nautilus, instead of a large surface ship. The United States and its nuclear program cannot tolerate any public tragedies. If there were to be a nuclear tragedy, better it should happen under the ocean. As Nautilus takes shape during 1954, the world's first nuclear sub shows no radical change from previous boats. The Nautilus was, in most respects, very much like the conventional submarines of the era, except for her propulsion plant. Forward, she was generally very much like those that were being built at the time. She is blunt-nosed, like old diesel subs meant to run on the surface most of the time. Later, nuclear sub-hull designs will be more hydrodynamic to cut through the water easier, so Nautilus is already obsolete. Forget about what kind of hull form would be really nice. How do you control it? How do you assure that when you go this way, it goes up or down at your desire? This is the first submarine in the world 
capable of sustained operation at very high speed, 23, 24 knots. And they know that the, the kind of control they've had in the past just doesn't react fast enough. If you don't react fast enough, it starts to dive and it crushes itself. So they have to relearn how to control the submarine. I'll have two thirds. For Nautilus, they try to develop controls that are much more responsive, and those look more like an airplane's controls. They had to invent new technologies on the fly as they were doing it. It was uh, half experimentation, half art, and science all mixed together. They were excellent engineers, and they had good technical knowledge. But you were building something that had never been built before. Finally, on the morning of January 17, 1955, Nautilus puts to sea for the first time. Bridge navigator, after you clear the submarine base channel here, your first course out will be 301. Her first captain, uh, Commander Eugene Wilkinson, makes a historic signal. Underway under nuclear power. We steamed down the river and uh, banks were lined up with school kids. They had turned all the school kids out so they could see the boat go to sea. As she hits the water, Nautilus stretches a bit over 323 feet with a beam just below 28 feet. She displaces just over 4,000 tons submerged. Her submerged top speed of 23 knots exceeds her 22 knot surface speed. Nautilus test depth is an impressive 700 feet she cost $40 million, twice the price of a destroyer. Nautilus isn't just a test ship for her power plant. She carries six forward torpedo tubes and 26 torpedoes, so she can also prove herself as a weapon to fight the Soviets, if her design works. Nautilus roars into her sea trials on May 10th, 1955. The old submarine hands are astonished by their accommodations. My bunk on the K-1 was a bunk that folded out alongside a torpedo. So you might say that my bunkmate was a 21-inch torpedo. On Nautilus, I was assigned a separate bunk in a 10-man stateroom. My own bunk, my own reading lamp, my own air-conditioned outlet. It was like moving from a pigsty to a palace. And then the crew's mess was so huge, it was like an entertainment center, so you didn't want for anything, and you were comfortable all the time. And on top of that, they had enough air conditioning, a nice, steady 70 degrees, 72 degrees, maybe. It was perfect. Going back to the diesel boats, we could last uh, maybe 12 to 24 hours submerged, and then we had to get up and air out the boat and get a fresh charge of air for breathing. And in those days, we all smoked cigarettes, so after about 12 hours, the smoking lamp was out because the air was so heavy with CO2 and CO that you couldn't see straight. In the Nautilus, we had CO2 scrubbers that literally scrubbed the CO2 out of the air and uh, once you went down, you were good to go. You had the equipment there to revitalize the atmosphere. You had fresh oxygen being bled in the ship. There wasn't much that we asked for that we didn't get. Uh, you know, it was like we were kind of pampered, I guess. But whatever her comforts, Nautilus must prove herself as a warship. During July and August of 1955, a state-of-the-art U.S. anti-submarine carrier force prepares to hunt and defend against her in her first fleet exercise efforts. Lower the ball. Ball going down. The stakes are high as surface ship officers get ready to assert their dominance against the new weapon. Nautilus must justify her existence.
going into fleet exercises in the summer of 1955, surface ship officers get ready to put down the upstart Nautilus. But soon the hunted becomes the hunter. Nautilus is a wonder weapon. They discover that uh, they can play games against surface ships. First T, this is rather slow, 8-2. Sonar contact bearing 067, range zero six one, seven. 100. Echo quality sharp, echo strength strong. Range one, one target with. They can show up somewhere and show themselves, put up a periscope. Surface ships start running towards the periscope and they show up somewhere else. Lost sonar contact, last bearing is 162, last range 2700. It was uh, kind of funny because uh, uh, they wouldn't know where we were. We'd run all over the place and, and uh, you know, you, you make believe like you sink them and then you tell the, tell the boat that you already, they're sunk, you know. So it was something really new because uh, we could outrun the surface craft and everything submerged. Submarine appears to be turning away from us. Bridge recommend increasing speed to 20 knots. Although the surface ships are, in theory, faster than the sub, in fact, in any kind of sea state, they're not. Instead of worrying about, say, a, a 10 or 20 mile run that the submarine can make before it runs out of juice, it's the whole ocean. There's no such thing as forcing her down or holding her down. It's a submarine which is as capable as a surface ship for the first time that anyone's ever experienced, in some ways more capable. Nautilus ambushes destroyers and submarines, speeds away from homing torpedoes and helicopter-dropped weapons. She overtakes speeding carrier groups submerged, attacks them at will, and remains beneath them undetected for 15 hours without challenge. First T, first T, this is rather slow, 8-2, lost contact. We speeded up and got under the screen, and we could simulate shooting one ship after another, and uh, we got them all. Not all the surprises are pleasant. The Nautilus crew of 12 officers and 105 enlisted men fight unexpected threats. The new design is full of near-fatal surprises. In her second year, one of these threatens to sink her. No submarine has ever sustained such underwater speeds and violent maneuvers over long periods. In the boat's first year, her hull construction meets strains beyond its design. They hadn't realized that at very high speeds, the, the submarine will start to shake. The effect of this flutter, the resonance effect, was to cause serious flooding forward. When we were making high speeds, you couldn't talk in the torpedo room. You couldn't hear each other talk. And the torpedoes actually bounced in the rack. So obviously, something was wrong. There's a rip in one of the ballast tanks. And so we sent a diver down with his uh, mask so he could take a better look. And yeah, we had about a four foot rip in the side of a tank. And sure enough, we had more than one rip. A quick fix can't hide that the boat may have been only hours from fatal failure. Because they literally could not keep the front end of the submarine in one piece. Other dangers are more constant. Lead shielding helps protect Nautilus's crew from reactor radiation. But the standards of exposure are still evolving. The crew is allowed exposure to 300 millirems per week, or 15,600 per year. Radiation workers are held to a 5,000 MR maximum. The yearly limit for the general population, less than 100 millirems. When we came in from sea, and uh, had some time off and went to the local beaches, uh, you actually received more radiation from the sun on the beach than we did on the 70-day run that we just come in off of. Even so, some Nautilus sailors are advised to caution their children against marrying the child of another nuclear crewman to lessen the odds for having children with birth defects. More new concerns. The atomic pile providing Nautilus's power is not easy to adjust. It is essentially either critical in operating or stopped. Neutron absorbing rods of the rare metal hafnium maintain control. There is not the instant response of pushing a brake or accelerator. 
In these pre-computer days, the Nautilus technicians must achieve the crucial equilibrium by hand. Every system aboard seems to have some sort of potentially fatal balance. But she continues to impress. We were setting records every day. Fastest trip, longest trip submerged. Every day was a new record for the Nautilus. SS-571 passes another huge technical milestone as her first 10-pound nuclear core lasts beyond expectations. The atomic power endures over two years and drives the boat 62,560 miles without refueling. The Navy has a sub that could stay submerged for an entire war, if the crew didn't have to eat. And now it's time for the new weapon to step into the middle of a Cold War. By 1957, Nautilus, with her reloaded atomic core, is steaming through a changed world. The Cold War spread to more fronts than ever before. Propaganda over nuclear testing. The missiles race with the deadly intercontinental ballistic missile, the ultimate threat. Think Cold War. What's the place closest to the Soviet Union? It's that ice-filled Arctic Ocean. And there was considerable interest after World War II in whether the Navy could operate freely in the Arctic. Well, submarine that can stay submerged permanently is sort of the ideal way to operate under the ice. So what do you do? You show that you can get under the North Pole, which is all water, but a lot of ice overhead. We would have a way to uh, defend ourselves against any uh, threat from Russia. So there was a, an impetus to get in there and learn how to conduct business uh, under the ice. The Arctic is the world's smallest ocean, only one and a half times as big as the United States. But it touches North America, Europe, Asia, and Greenland, making it strategic in any war. President Eisenhower orders Nautilus north on a critical mission. To transit the Arctic ice cap and gauge missile warfare possibilities. The voyage is dangerous. Beginning her first run for the North Pole on August 19, 1957, the Nautilus, under a new skipper, Commander William Anderson, is still in the primitive days of atomic sub operating systems. The age of global positioning satellites is decades away. SS-571 is poorly equipped to deal with the special dangers of Arctic navigation, especially for a voyage spent entirely under the ice cap, cut off from radio signals and the stars. Navigating in the Arctic Basin is difficult at best, but the closer you get to the pole, the harder it gets. And here we were with pretty antiquated equipment, really a magnetic compass that points not to the North Pole, but it points to the magnetic North Pole, which happened to be south and west of us over towards Hudson Bay somewhere. So that isn't much use getting to the North Pole. If you think about how you're going to get out of the Arctic Basin, you want to go south the way you came in. But if you can visualize all those longitudinal lines coming up to the point at the North Pole, then each one of them represents a direction south. South to Russia, south to Canada, south to Greenland, south to England. Which south do you like? As for sea charts, the spaces under the polar ice remain as uncharted as the center of the Earth. There are fears of navigation failures, leading to what sailors call Arctic roulette. A sub without functioning directional devices circling lost and beyond communications under the ice pack until all aboard die. On August 29, 1957, Nautilus passes beneath the Arctic Circle to attempt her first penetration under the ice. 
Her numbers have been painted off to keep her mission and her identity secret. Captain Anderson is dealing with dozens of chilling and unanswered questions. How unpredictably deep and jagged is the ice above? Could the sub be fatally trapped between the ice and ocean floor? They really weren't sure what the ice coverage was going to be in the new area that they were exploring. Unfortunately for them, the ice forms and changes shape continuously. So even though you saw a block of ice here now, if you came back to it a half hour or an hour later, it had changed shape. So to use ice as navigation aid was, was perilous. Fathometers are placed both below and above the sub, one bouncing sound waves off the bottom, another off the ice. The results are transmitted back to the sub like an echo of pinging sound waves. On board, sonar technicians analyze the echo to create a profile of the space through which the submarine travels. We were trucking along under the ice at a pretty good clip, and all of a sudden, we lost our gyros. A fuse had blown in the gyro circuitry and uh, dropped the uh, main gyro off the line. We didn't really know where we were, didn't know which way south was, didn't know which way the opening was to the Greenland Gap. So as you, uh, we were navigating with uh, thermometers, with uh, fathometers, anything that anybody could think of, dead reckoning. That took us 74 hours to get out from under the ice. And it was, it was a very trying time for the crew. You know, being lost under the ice and trying to figure your way out is, it's not good. <laughs> On her way out, an aborted attempt to surface results in two badly bent periscopes. Now Nautilus badly needs refitting, and her first crack at the North Pole ends as she runs back home. She won't be gone long, and her dangers have just begun. events will quickly send Nautilus back to the North Pole. The race into space moved from the planning and dream stages into dramatic reality in the year 1957. While the United States was to make its own voice heard far out in the world of space, it was the Russians who launched the first Earth satellite October 4, 1957. It was to be known as Sputnik, the Russian word for satellite. All of a sudden, we had gone from being a preeminent scientific uh, navy to being in the background now because of the Russians' advances in science through Sputnik. So we had to do something to catch up. A grim President Eisenhower orders Nautilus back to reach the North Pole and to transit the Arctic beneath the ice. It becomes a matter of national honor. As the Nautilus hurriedly refits to meet her deadline, there are two obvious problems. First, to fit the boat with something better to meet the awesome navigational difficulties of transiting under ice. And second, to develop a deception plan that will keep the Soviets from noticing. In the middle of 1958, the Nautilus receives new orders from Washington. Her crew is told that they will proceed from New London, Connecticut to the West Coast via the Panama Canal for exercises with the Pacific Fleet. But her crew is unaware that this is just a cover story for their real mission, to dash across the Arctic to the North Pole. Expecting a return home for repairs, her surprise crew learns that the boat will steer instead for the Aleutians, cross the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea, and head across the North Pole. If Nautilus survives, she will have crossed under 2,000 miles of Arctic ice pack. But important things fail constantly on submarines, and inevitably, major things do fail during Nautilus's long cruise from the East Coast. Our great uh, atmospheric control system seemed to be failing us, and 
We didn't know what it was. It smelled bad all through the boat. It smelled kind of painty or oily. There is a leak in one of the hundreds of fittings of the Nautilus's carbon dioxide scrubber, the machinery for keeping the air breathable for long periods. The crew's eyes now sting constantly from accumulated gases. Then, a separate leak affects another vital system. Although powered by a nuclear reactor, Nautilus is still a steamship. The water heated into steam in the boilers must flow through convoluted piping and back into a main condenser as part of a critical cycle to keep power surging reliably. We developed a salt water leak in our port condenser and we worked hard to try and find that leak and no amount of uh, investigation would reveal exactly where the leak was and we were looking at like 2,000 condenser tubes and trying to figure out which one was leaking. Making a fast stop at Seattle, the Nautilus crewmen try a not-in-the-book fix for the condenser leak. The captain came up with that we should get some stop leak, radiate a stop leak, maybe that would do the trick. And so he and Lieutenant Early, our engineer officer, got several sailors to go ashore and buy some stop leak at the auto stores. The crew is dropped ashore after they are ordered into civilian clothes to avoid drawing attention to this special critical mission. They got all the stop leak they could buy. I mean, bottle after bottle of this stuff. They brought it back and we dumped it into the condenser. And wouldn't you know it, wouldn't you just know it, it worked. It stopped the salt water leak. All of a sudden, the captain announces that he wants the uh, seaman gang topside with their paint pots to paint out the numbers on the ship. And you know, what the heck's going on? So we did that, and then he announces. All hands, this is the captain speaking. I have on board a top secret operation order. There are perhaps only about a dozen people in the country who know about this plan. Our mission is one of extreme importance to our country. Our mission is to proceed Portland, England via the North Pole. Wow. On their second attempt at transiting under the Arctic ice by way of the North Pole, Nautilus crewmen try to better prepare for the danger that they know awaits them. They have taken aboard Dr. Waldo Lyon, an under ice expert from the Arctic lab, along with improved navigation equipment a North American Aviation N6A inertial guidance system. It was an old Air Force program. It was a nose cone from a Navajo missile. The missile guidance system is designed for very high speeds for very short periods of time. We were doing just the opposite. We were gonna go on relatively low speeds for a long time. And our concern was was this thing going to run for months? On the Pacific side, the bottom depth is a problem. We had to come back around on the eastern side of St. Lawrence Island to even get up through the Bering Sea, through the Bering Strait, into the Chukchi Sea. We underran an ice ridge that gave us about 20 feet of clearance, and we didn't like that. We went deeper. We underran a second ridge which gave us a clearance of about 10 feet. We're getting into trouble. It's like a sandwich. The bottom is one slice of bread and the ice is the other slice of bread, and there's not much between. The echoes out of the sonar boxes come faster and faster as the space between the ocean floor and ice above close ominously. There is no hope of surfacing and no possible radio contact. The crew of the Nautilus struggled to keep their focus as they begin to wonder and worry if they are destined to spend the rest of eternity in the cold, silent darkness under the North Pole. On her second attempt to reach the North Pole in 1958, 
a submerged USS Nautilus finds herself squeezed relentlessly into a fast-narrowing trap. The display that Dr. Lyon was looking at, which was an upward beam sounder, showing the distance from the top of the sail to the bottom of the ice, the distance got less and less and less and less, and essentially merged at the zero line. And it was almost a reaction that you would expect in the attack center where all this was taking place. All of us kind of scrunched our shoulders down as, as if we were trying to pull the top of the sail down under that piece of ice. With only 20 feet between the stern and the bottom, it wouldn't have taken much of an up angle before we were dragging the screws in the mud. On June 16, 1958, Captain Anderson makes the disappointing announcement. Men, we do not know as much about this place as I thought we did. I'm going to see if I can get us out of here. Dr. Lyon's display started showing increasing water between us and the ice ridge. You could almost hear the entire ship sigh in relief that we hadn't actually struck something. All ahead full. All ahead full. Nautilus's second under ice thrust to transit the Arctic has failed. Washington orders Nautilus to Hawaii. With all foul weather gear carefully hidden below decks and her men sworn to top secrecy, the boat sticks to its cover story and pretends it has arrived on a PR mission. But the intention is to go back for another attempt at the pole within a month. The dangers of the return trip multiply as a Cold War crisis explodes across the world in the Middle East when President Eisenhower rushes forces into Lebanon to bolster its pro-Western government. I am well aware the landing of United States troops in Lebanon could have some serious consequences. With the increase in East-West military tensions, both the Soviet and American superpowers go on alert against enemy warship movements. With the Nautilus mission being as secret from American planes as from the Soviet subhunters, the air above the Arctic Circle fills with killer aircraft from both sides who will attack her on sight. Bearing 350, range 1000. In her concealed voyage back north, she logs 40,000 leagues, 12,000 miles under the sea, twice the 20,000 leagues of the Jules Verne Nautilus. I think the primary feeling of the crew for the third trip was the third time is the charm, and this time we're going to make it. Everybody had an opportunity to say to the captain, I don't want to go. Nobody took that opportunity. So we were running along the edge of the ice pack, trying to find a break point where we could go deeper and run. And we finally found one off Point Barrow. It is called the Barrow Sea Valley. John, come left to course north. The V-shaped Barrow Sea Valley is an underwater superhighway and lies 1,200 feet below the peaks above it. Running 150 miles long and 15 miles wide, it connects the shallow Chuck Chi Shelf to the deeper Beaufort Sea. Once we got into the Barrow Sea Valley, we could go deeper and start running faster and heading north. And it became a routine run. A little bit disappointing. It was kind of anticlimactic. We had it so easy. Good food, nice atmosphere. And we didn't have all those worries of uh, Perry and his sled dogs crossing the ice and uh, having to suffer through the cold. We just had a grand old time getting there. 
On the morning of August 3rd, 1958, Captain Anderson says a prayer for world peace and begins a countdown to his much delayed conquest of the North Pole. And then we had a celebration in the cruise mess. We had a North Pole cake. Santa Claus came aboard, and he was a little bit bent out of shape because we're interrupting his summer vacation. We were met by a helicopter at the appropriate time after we had surfaced, and the captain was flown back to Washington where President Eisenhower made the official announcement of the completion of this trip. The crossing itself took four days. The distance covered was 1,830 miles. And I don't think it hit anybody real hard until we got to England. And the people were mobbed waiting for us. Gee, what have we done? It was beyond us. The same thing happened in New York. They couldn't get enough of us. And just like that, SS-571 has put the United States back near the top of the world's technology heap. Answering Sputnik with her conquest of the northern battlefield in the Arctic. We proved that we could operate under the ice cap. We could be there anytime, anywhere, and they, the Russians, the Soviet Union at the time, wouldn't know we were there and even if they knew we were there, they wouldn't know where we were. What it really did was open up, if from a strategic standpoint, 3,000 miles of Russian coastline. If something had gone wrong, if Nautilus had proven an expensive failure, as many people might have expected, I don't think you would ever have seen a nuclear navy, let alone nuclear subs. No nuclear subs would have meant no strategic deterrence with invisible nuclear submarines, which was terribly important, keeping the Cold War cold. Nautilus goes on to serve everywhere the Cold War is fought, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. But as expected, she will be the one and only boat in her class. Even so, her impact on the future of the submarine service is vast. She ushered in a whole new era of nuclear power. She provided uh, new capability. She revolutionized uh, anti-surface and anti-submarine warfare. Every one of the rapidly evolving superboats of the U.S. submarine service in the world owes its existence to the men who first sailed in the dangerous Nautilus experiment. That was the first nuclear-powered war vessel men who endured marathon deployments with families who shared the cost of painful absences. Nautilus's loyal crews are the backbone of an effort to preserve her as a floating museum and the sub base at New London, Connecticut after she goes out of commission in 1973. The crew on the, uh, on the first Nautilus uh, was like a uh, big family. We had been living together, we had been to school together. We're a pretty tight bunch. And I think the events that Nautilus went through pretty much cemented us all together for, for our lifetime. They still ask me today how I'm taking care of their ship and uh, that kind of ownership and camaraderie that only can be forged in hardship and hard work and doing things that no one else does. We've benefited enormously as a country and probably as a world from this submarine. Anybody who wants to see where the nuclear Navy was born and learn about the men who braved the perils of its earliest days needs to visit USS Nautilus, a national legacy rich in gallant history. <laughs>